The whole process of, of um, setting the crops in Leitrim particularly would be in the springtime of the year, possibly around the middle of March, they'd start to plough the ground, depending on, of course, the weather. But if the ground was fairly dry, they would start to plough the ground, uh, harrow the ground for oats and barley. Oats and barley were the main crops now. The odd time they might set rye, but it would be in a different area of the land. Rye was not a crop that they'd be using much of, but the rye straw was very, um, um, they used to get it for thatching, and it was, it was a very, very good type of straw, uh, rye straw. But other than that, mostly oats. Now, oats for uh, the house, the household, and for the cattle, and for the fowl. So oats was a very important crop. Barley, uh, less barley than oats, but a fair amount of it too, they used to sow that for uh, cattle feed um, in the winter time. Um, but going back to the, 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 the setting of the crop, March and into April, there would be sowing the oats. Now, if it wasn't sown before the cuckoo came, they wouldn't be too happy because after that they would call it cuckoo oats and it wouldn't grow in time to harvest it wouldn't mature enough to have it ready for we say late august or early september so they like to have it in before the cuckoo then there wasn't much trouble with the oats crop except there came stormy weather or something like that in 1962 i think was it or before that the storm debbie uh, was it came in early september and it thrashed every field of oats in this area. Oats was just ready to be cut. And I remember my father going out looking at the field of oats we had at the back of the house and there wasn't a single head on the oats from the storm. But that rarely happened. So they were starting to cut the oats late August, early September. And unless you had a lot of oats, uh, one man on his own would, would, would cut an acre, an acre and a half of oats in the day. He'd be taking it fairly steady now, but he'd, he'd cut it with a side. I don't remember the reaping hook, but prior to that, they cut it with a, with a, sh a sickle or a reaping hook, which was a difficult tool to manage because you were practically built over at 90 degrees and cut it with a hook in your hand as you went along. So it was a very, very slow process. Um, there was, we used to talk about, my father used to tell about a man that a young man that went to town and saw this new invention called a side, which obviously has been used up to the present time. But at that time it was a new invention and the son bought it and brought it home to the father and he showed it to him. And he said to him, there's a new tool for cutting oats. Would you like to have a look at it? And he said, oh, I don't know. I would have nothing to do with it. So he showed it to him and he said, oh, bring it away. And he said, well, I'll show you how it works. So he cut a couple of swords with it as he walked along. And he said to the father, now, what do you think of that? Nothing to do with it, he said. Keep it out of my sight. He said, and he said, well, what do you think of it? He said, I think it was an awful lazy man invented it. So that was, if they didn't get it the hard way, they didn't like. But anyway, um, the oats was cut, um, tied and stooped. Uh, now the tying, the cutting of it was important and the tying of it was important so you would have three people working in the field of oats at the time. You had one man cutting it, another man what they called taking it out, um, where he would make it in little bundles and he then would tie it with a few pieces of long oats straw from it, tie it up and leave it on the ground and then someone else would come along after him and put it into stooks. Now stooks were propped, sheaves of oats propped against other, maybe four or six like that. And then in some cases they'd build three more on the top and put a hero or a straw rope around them. That's, that was called stooking oats. 
It was left in the stooks then for maybe a fortnight or two weeks, depending on the weather, to season and dry out. And it was brought into the garden then, um, close to the house, some kind of a closed in, sheltered garden, but um, enough of access that the trashing mill would get into it. So it wasn't put out in the middle of a field, but it was put in a sheltered place convenient to the house. Um, then it was built into what they call a stack. Um, the other one was a stoop, this was a stack of oats. Um, that was all built, well built, and left there ready for the treasure when he came. Now the treasure mill would, he'd have his clients to call to, so he'd give you a time when he'd be with you. Now obviously the weather would have a big bearing on it. So whenever the day was good, uh, he'd come with the treasure mill. And the treasure mill uh, was usually driven by um, um, a, a tractor engine with a, with a pulley belt on the side of it, usually a big old tractor. It was sometimes brought into the garden with asses because maybe it wasn't that easy getting in the mill and the tractor so that all of us have a couple of asses to hook up to the mill and pull it into the garden. Um, the big old major tractor, one of them would pull alongside it with a pulley belt from here to that tree over there and then she'd start working the, the main wheel on the trashing mill and she'd be ready to go. Now at that stage you would need four to six men working the trasher. So uh, you could call it a mehel, I suppose. Um, we would go to our neighbours uh, trashing and then their other neighbours would come to us. So it was a, a sort of a robin roundabout. Everyone went with the trasher to help out. So you'd have one man, two men on the on on top of the trasher cutting the belts and putting the sheaves down into it. One man cutting the the other man putting the sheaf down. You'd have two men at the back of the trasher um gathering the bags. The the corn came out or the oats came out through the um, hopper I came down and you had to be ready to move the bags as quickly as it was coming out. So you needed two people, one to hang the bag on and the other one to take it away. Then you had another man or two putting away the straw. The straw came out on a different thing up on the top of the trasher. The straw came out on the kickers and that kicked it down and onto the ground. You needed two men there, one man forking it up onto um, a reek, a, a straw reek, and the other man up taking it in and building it because the straw had to be built then. It was very important to have a good, safe reek of straw for bedding cattle, or in some cases feeding cattle, but mostly for bedding. So that was a very important job. This was a permanent fixture for the rest of the winter. The oats was taken away then as it was coming off the um, trasher and wheeled away into the barn where it was kept and left ready for the day you'd be going to the mill. So that had been kept dry and moved in quickly and as I say, if the day was wet it would have to be stopped because wet oats obviously would go blue moulded so it wasn't suitable. Um, so it was a busy, busy time even though there was lots of fun and games and that at it but it was more work now than fun. There was um, usually a feed of bacon and cabbage that day um, done up for the day with the housewife in the house and Neighbours would come in to help with the cooking and getting everything ready. So all in all, you'd have about 12 or 14 people around the house on that day. And the following day, then you would move off to a neighbour's ground. Uh, that would be a short version of what went on that day at the, at the treasure. Um, following on from that then, depending on where your slot came in, you would make contact with the mill immediately. Now, usually you would go to the same mill year in, year out unless something happened, they uh, fallen out or something like that. You would go to the mill. We were lucky in that we had first cousins who owned the mill. And uh, I wouldn't say we got prime time, but we, we would be sure enough that our, our oats would be made at the mill. They call it making the meal rather than grinding the meal. Of what to say, <coughs> are you going to the mill next week to get your oats made? Um, that was a most important day. That was the day that <coughs> everything depending on the meal being ground 
and getting it home in the dry weather. It was all to do with dry weather because it was brought to the mill on the horse and cart and would have to be brought home on the horse and cart. So you had to be fairly lively on the day and on the job. Um, the miller would have came to the mill to start the mill probably about three weeks before the milling would start. And he was um, a journeyman miller, if you like. He would go to a mill, we say, the first week in August, and he'd set up the mill. Um, then he'd be ready uh, to start milling within about a week. He had to pick the mill. The mill stone was obviously a granite stone, and it ground against another granite stone on top. So there was a whole lot of little indentations in the millstone, little little peaks coming up of out of the stone. So he had a little pick hammer and he went along with meticulously and he picked going that way and one going that way. So he had to be exact about picking the stone. Now from year to year the millstone would have got um, worn, obviously. So it had to be done like like very, very, very carefully. And then the stone on top had to be done the same. So the two millstones had to be picked and it was a very, very precise job. If the weren't picked or picked according to the way they should be done, you would get bad meal. You would get a lot of dusty stuff and it wouldn't it wouldn't work well. So the most important part of the mill was having the stone in prime condition. Um, the work at the mill itself was notoriously hard uh, in my estimation. Um, there was a man, one man's job was to bring the meal, uh, the, we said the oats, up on his back onto the um, shelf of the on the top of the mill. Now that would be six, seven foot tall, and there was a ladder going up, a wooden ladder that he climbed up with a 14 stone bag on his back, which was incredible. 14 stone of oats he carried up on his back and emptied it onto, the, left it, sorry, left it on the, the shelf or the, the casing at the top of the mill, and then another man fed it into the mill itself. So there was two men up there <coughs> on the platform. Um, there was, again, a couple of men at the back of the mill hanging the bags of uh, corn, uh, meal as they came out and moving it. Um, again, very, very, very speedy work, fast work. If Once the mill started, there was no such thing as turning it off. You just kept it going. Well, obviously you'd be turning it off, but, but you couldn't be stopping and starting it. Um, the mill itself, <clears throat> was within a couple of miles of here. It was called Hart's Mill and it was called a good mill. Uh, it was what they called an undershot mill. So the sluice would be watched for weeks beforehand. Um, the mill would probably be about an eighth of a mile long uh, with several sluice gates on it where the water was coming down. Now, depending on the uh, supply of water, um, they could open the sluice gates fully or they could open them a little bit. Um, they didn't want to rush the, the mill wheel, so it was a steady turning and a steady flow of water let down to drive the mill wheel. And the mill wheel obviously worked the rest of it. It was geared down with, with and the gudgeons would be geared down, geared down until you came to the very mill itself where they were milling and it would be only about that size where the, the shaft of the mill on the outside would be about 18 inches diameter or two foot diameter so it was it was geared down to that extent. Um, yeah there was a man on the sluice gates then letting it go or sluicing it as needed be. Um, <clears throat> that would be the process then of you had to then gather your bags of meal and head for home with them in the dry weather and bring them in. Now, <clears throat> with all the oats that were set, I'd say out of a half an acre of oats, well, there'd be an acre and a half or two acres of oats, um, and there would be a lot of oats, obviously, coming off that. Of that, I would say about, depending on the family, I suppose, but about six bags, six hundredweight bags 
of meal would be made. Do you know, the, the, all the oats, in other words, that they would have harvested wouldn't be made into meal. It would be used for hens and cattle and horses and whatever. It was an animal feed. But the, the, the meal that was made for the household was brought home then and put into what they call a big bin. There was a bin in most houses next to the fireplace and if there wasn't it was put in a very sheltery warm house. And it was put there to keep it dry and to keep it safe. Of course you had mice and rats and everything else. So uh, it, was, it was a very, very important ingredient or crop or household food uh, for, for, for the winter to come. And it was used in several different versions. The obvious one was the, the bread, oatmeal bread, uh, mixed with a bit of heart's delight flour. Heart's delight was the flour that everyone bought, not the hearts that owned the meal. We used to think it was, but it wasn't. Um, it was, it was um, mixed with a bit of um, heart's delight flour, or sometimes made with just wholemeal, but that would be very strong. Um, Porridge, of course, was uh, used in every house, not just for breakfast, but I remember my grandfather would eat porridge about three times a day. He certainly would eat it in the morning. Um, he would have it before he go to bed and maybe during the day as well. Um, they made a cake, a biscuit, if you like, called Orton Bonnock. Now, I don't know where the word Bonnock come from. It sounds Scottish to me. And there is an equivalent of that particular type of food in Scotland called um, oat cake. Uh, we made it at home ourselves. Not everybody made it, but I've seen it made uh, on a griddle uh, in front of the fire. It was, it was a, you make it into a, a firm cake. Nothing in it now, the oatmeal, water and salt. And it was leveled out on the table, on a pan, and it was put in front of the fire to be roasted. And a very important aspect of it was that uh, during the years of immigration uh, in the mid-1800s up to the early 1900s, people went, uh, obviously, by boat to America. And uh, they brought their food with them, some of it at least, um, the food, on board the ships that left out of Cove um, would have been fairly basic or poor uh, for people who were, we call steerage passengers, obviously there wouldn't have been too many that would have been able to pay their fare, fare to America and be up <coughs> on the better decks. So the Irish people had to settle for, as I said, down in the steers, down in the belly of the ship and the food that would be put up for them would be very, very basic. It would really amount to what was left over up on decks and uh, made into a type of a gruel and fed them down, down below. So oftentimes they brought uh, a food with them called bannock. It is a very basic food. It was made from uh, oatmeal ground, uh, flour, bit of flour or, or wholemeal, uh, water, salt and a bit of butter. And that's basically what they did. And they make it into a little cake, an oat cake, put it along with their bundle that they brought to America with them. And uh, there was two advantages to it. First of all, it was, um, it, it would be a reasonably good diet. It, it wouldn't be the whole thing, but at least it would be, would have a good amount of nutrients or nutrition. Um, secondly, it could be stored very easily and it would keep for up to six months if you had to. We presume that time when the ship left from Cork and before it landed at Ellis Island, it would be roughly six or eight weeks depending on the weather. So they had a bundle of this which they could fall back on, <clears throat> on their trip and as I say, it was quite nutritious as well. So most houses would have a tradition of making oat and meal, oat and bonnock. Um, this would be the time of year they'd be making it uh, because the harvest was in, the, the oats was ground and it was kept in the kitchen for bread making. As I say, it's, it's a couple of very basic ingredients 
the main one being um, pinhead oatmeal or oatmeal. This now would be a coarse um, oatmeal. Probably the ones that they would have used would be more ground than that. That's pretty grainy. So what I do with that is I uh, usually put it into... Now, uh, just to refine some of the grain, it's, it's pinhead oatmeal, which means it's fairly coarse. So I'm just taking a bit of it here, um, grinding it down so as that will bind more easily uh, when I put it all together. Easy man. This is the time of year, as I said, that they'll be making it. Traditionally, um, it would be made after the harvest came in. And I see in Scotland there was a festival uh, around the making of bonnock. Bonnock, as far as I can establish, is an Irish word for um, oat cake. Uh, there's an, an anglicization of it in England, also called bonnock, spelled different. But um, as far as I know, it may have originated from Ireland, but there would be a lot of interaction between Scotland and Ireland anyway. So it's still quite traditional in Scotland to make it at certain times of year. Actually, this day is Bonnock Day in Scotland, so make it there. This here is a bit of wholemeal flour. Um, that again uh, would be just to, to, to bind it more than anything else, to bind the, 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 the oatmeal. Um, so I'll just put that into it. The salt in this, by the way, so it goes a bit of salt and sugar. I'll put a bit of sugar with it as well. The next job I have to do now is put in butter. Butter just to, again, to help to bind it. Now, this butter, I cut up there. This is homemade butter, I made it last night. That, by the way, is the buttermilk from, from that. But this is homemade butter, so I'll, I'll just slice a bit of that into it. It's, uh, what would I say, slightly more salty than what you'd be used to in, in creamery butter. But this is what I grew up on, homemade butter. And when there was visitors coming to the house, this was made in every house, obviously, butter. And very seldom you would buy, is to call it creamery butter. So when we had visitors coming or Yankees coming on holidays, we used to be delighted because my mother would have to buy creamery butter. And it tasted so, so much nicer than what we were used to. But having said that, uh, <laughs> it's about twice the price of creamery butter now. So I still make a bit of it from time to time, just. And um, then I pour hot water over. People were going away to work. I'm talking about people going to America and bringing it with them. That time in this, these months of the year, there was a lot of people on the move. Um, Tatty Hawken and Donegal, they were going from Scotland, from Donegal to Scotland, digging potatoes. And there was, of course, seasonal workers moving all over the country, that and cutting oats um, at the trashing. Uh, so it was, as I say, for people on the move, be it in the country or outside the country, it was very, very easy carried, good food and easy to make. So that was another reason. I don't know if any, I don't think any of the bakeries ever went about making it, but um, it'd be all homemade, I say. And uh, sometimes swapped for other things. People might have made jam at this time of year and didn't make bonnock. So if you were going to a neighbor's house, you might bring a few pans of bonnock with you and you might bring home a pot of 
black curtain jam or apple jam or something like that. So it was um, it was well steeped within the Irish tradition anyway, for one reason or another. And uh, just put it out a, a dusting of, of of wholemeal flour on the board, and I'll put it onto that, and then we'll try and get it into shape for uh, cooking. And that's about it. People were putting it onto um, a griddle, which was um, a cooking utensil that stood up in front of an open fire. So you put this onto the griddle, uh, propped it as close as you could to the fire, not too close, that you wouldn't burn it, and bake it, bake it in front of the fire, standing on a, on a griddle. When you had one side of it done, obviously you turn it around and bake it on the other side. Um, the other way they used to cook it was put it onto a pan, a frying pan, a regular cast iron frying pan, and um, bake it all on top of coals in front of the fire. You take out the coals as they did with bacon bread, put them under and over. You put a lid on top of the oven or, fry or a pan and you did them that way. Or now, of course, we do them in ovens and, and the rest of it. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put it in onto, it's actually a, um, a griddle of a sort, it's a metal griddle, and I'm going to put it onto that, but I'm going to cut them into little sections so as that I can, uh, they're easier managed that way, a bit of both. Now, since you live well enough alone, pop them in the oven anyway, it's at around 200, so I think that's about fairly okay. And it should take 15, 20 minutes. Yes, it's hot. Oh, shocking hot. That's metal and it's very suitable for cooking this stuff, but it's mighty hot. Now, that's the finished product. That's what we'd say would be going to America or anywhere else you wanted to bring it, but uh, it's, it's, you know, it's firm. It'll be firmer when it gets cold, but um, it could be packed away. And as I say, the people were very glad to have it in their bundle because that's what they called their belongings when they were going to America. They gathered up all their little bits and pieces and tied it in a bundle. And this was a big part of the bundle or an important part of the bundle, I should say. Um, so other people obviously <laughs> ended up and down the country and wherever they went or if they were traveling or at home or whatever. Um, as I said, the Americans would have, or the Irish going to America would have brought that and it would have, the last of it would be eaten beyond on Ellis Island when they were getting off the boat. Um, uh, we as children brought it to school and it was very, what would you call it, tradable. Uh, not everybody had Orton Bonnet going to school and um, there was a woman beside us actually, Mrs Kelleher, she was particularly good at it and there was all kind of grades of bonnet but she, she was the queen of the bonnet makers and if you got that you were doing fierce well but generally you could trade it for just about anything up to and including somebody to do your homework for you.